morning, everybody. Before you sit down, <laughs> let's bow ahead for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Father, for gathering all your dear children from far and near to this wonderful conference. It is you who have gathered them because you have brought them unto you to speak to them, Lord, to show yourselves to them, to make yourselves manifest to them. And they have come with open hearts, with open hands, with open eyes, and with open ears to hear what God will speak to them. And your word tells us, all those who come to you, you will never send them empty-handed. And we thank you, Lord, for beginning a good work last night. You spoke to each and every one of your dear children. And you also began a good work this morning. You spoke to your children. Now, one more time. We humble ourselves before you and we ask you to open our eyes, to open our ears, to give us an understanding heart and a listening ear that we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to the churches in these last days. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, everybody. It is wonderful and great to see all of you all in this conference. And each time we come here for this uh, Lancaster Prophetic Conference, it's so good to see many, many familiar faces. And I just noticed something last night. Not only I see many, many familiar faces, but I also see those familiar faces seated in the same position. <laughs> How in the world you can memorize where you were seated the last year, it, it mystifies me. You know, for a long time last night, I was seated in that corner, and I was just observing the many regular comers. They were seated in the exact same position. So that's good. So you all are like the members of the United Nations Security Council. <laughs> the permanent members of the Security Council. You cannot change them. They are permanent. So you are like that. So remember, since you have a permanent seat here, you must come year after year. This is our annual family gathering. Amen. 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 So this is like a homecoming. So Thanksgiving comes early in Lancaster. <laughs> you don't wait till November. It begins in August. Amen. Amen. You know, many years ago, during the first few years of this conference, Brother Neville Johnson and I used we were speaking every year, and uh, it was during one of those early years, the Lord spoke to both of us individually, and then when we compared notes, we found that it was the same thing. The Lord told us to cut going to speak in other cities in the U.S. and to only concentrate in Lancaster. He said, this is my chosen place where I will gather my remnant. I will gather my remnant here. It's like little eaglets. They will be gathered in this nesting place to be taught by the Lord, to be prepared by the Lord. So ever since the Lord spoke that to us, we stopped going to speak in any other conferences in other cities in the U.S., but we make our annual visit here. Like the salmons, you know. 
they swim up, <laughs> they right? So just like that. Like those birds, like those animals, they all make an annual pilgrimage. So we all make our annual pilgrimage here to be taught of the Lord. And last night, while the worship was going on, as they were singing the last song, I love you, Lord. And they repeated it three times. And on the final time as they were singing the song, I saw a vision in heaven. In the vision, I saw the Lord Jesus standing at the edge of heaven and looking down at this gathering. And he had a bread in his hand, three slices of bread. At that moment, I didn't understand what those three slices meant. But now, at this moment, I, I understand what it is. It is the three speakers. And he broke the bread and he said, I will feed my children with this bread. So it, it is the Lord who will break bread to feed his people. Amen. You know, there are many, many places of refuge that God has chosen in the last days. And Lancaster in this place is one of those places of refuge to hide in the last days. So someone recently asked me a question. You know, you said that there's going to come a big earthquake in California. So is it time that we should move out of California? Please tell us. So I pondered over that situation. What to answer? Because I saw that massive great earthquake that will strike in this region. And the angels of destruction who will oversee that have already been stationed all along the coastline where the earthquake is going to be strike or stationed. So this being the case, so what should we do? And then See, if God has chosen this place as refuge, so even when the earthquake strike, all will fall except Lancaster. So this is still a safe place. It's a place of refuge. Amen? Just like Goshen in Egypt. When judgment fell on Egypt, there was destruction all over Egypt except Goshen. There was darkness all over Egypt except Goshen. Everybody was dropping down dead, even the cattle, the birds, the frogs, the flies, the rats, the cockroaches, and the house flies, and the company flies. Oh yeah, don't you know that? If they are house flies, the same fly that you find in companies, they're called company flies. <laughs> They'll all drop dead except in Goshen. Because that is the place chosen by God where the remnant are. So the, and where the remnant are is where the Lord himself is. So when he is, how can there be destruction? Amen? So, <clears throat> we are in safe grounds. Amen? And there is a wonderful pastor, Joseph Sweet. Isn't he sweet? <laughs> Look at him. Very sweet. Not only his last name is sweet, He's just too sweet. <laughs> Not only he's too sweet, his wonderful wife is three sweet. <laughs> See, why didn't you want to clap for her? <laughs> Everybody makes this terrible mistake, you know. 
we only applaud the pastor and we forget the pastor's wife. The pastor's wife works two times more than the pastor. <laughs> so they deserve two clap. <laughs> so pastor's sweet is too sweet, his wife is three sweet, <laughs> and they have five sweet children. <laughs> So this is a, when you come to a sweet church, I mean a sweet pastor, the church is also sweet. All the wonderful volunteers and members in this church are very, very sweet. Amen. So when you meet the volunteers and though all those who are working day and night for this conference, just shake their hands and say, thank you for serving us. That's the least we can do for all their hard works. All right. Last night we had a very wonderful message and our brother Bobby Connor made a good start. Powerful message about sonship. That is a very, very powerful uh, manifestation that needs to take place in the last days. Even the scripture says that the creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now there are many, many mysteries related to that. But we don't want to look into that mysteries today. We will reserve it for next year's conference. Okay? I'm, I'm very tempted right now to share with you that mystery, but I will just hold it for next year. <laughs> no matter how much you whine, <laughs> I'm not going to be fooled by all that. Anyway, two days ago, I was seeking the Lord concerning what He wants to speak at this conference. And on the 8th of August at 8.35 in the morning, as I was praying, the Lord Jesus visited me and He said this one sentence, the journey is going to begin. Prepare for it. Just that one sentence. The journey is going to begin. Prepare for it. Now that sentence can mean many things to many people. For this church, it will mean the glory is going to begin. Prepare for it. That journey, please don't clap unnecessarily. When you need to clap, I'll give you the signal. Okay? That's how I do it in the Philippines. They give me a clapboard. Clap. Stop. Shout now. Laugh. Then stop. So now you stop. <coughs> now. So the journey is going to begin. Prepare for it. Now that means many things. So one is, like I said earlier, for particularly this church, they have done a lot of preparation for not a day of for two days, for years. God has been leading them, preparing them for a mighty outpouring of the fire and the rains of God, the glory of God to be poured out. So now the journey is going to begin. So prepare, prepare for it. And Pastor Sweet shared a wonderful preface last night about some preparation they did and how they experience the glory of God still in a very small measure. 
it wasn't in a big measure like how we read in second chronicles chapter 5 it's a small measure and it was a sample given by god if one small group of believers believing the word of god can do it for one sunday and experience that how much more if the whole church 100 percent of every church member young and old all do that week after week after week the cloud will begin to build up and build up and build up so much so one sunday when your church people are trying to get in they cannot get in because this whole place will be flooded with the shekinah cloud of god so your church will not just be shekinah in name it will be shekinah in deed with the thick cloud of god and if you observe very carefully the principles that pastor sweet was sharing last night we'll find several principles there the most important of it was sanctification and the second important thing was preparation and the third important principle was worship there was no teaching no preaching just worshiping god and the glory of the lord came down and the lord himself ministered to his people that is the desire of the lord not only in these present times but it has been his desire from the beginning of times and that's where now the journey has is going to begin towards that and we need to prepare for it so i intended to meditate more on that sentence that the lord told me and get further understanding about it last night after this wonderful meeting when i went back to my room as soon as i entered i saw the lord jesus christ seated on the sofa and the first thing he asked me was how was the meeting so I explained to the Lord Jesus what our dear brother Bobby shared about sonship and all that. And he said, he's my wonderful good speaker. I'm sure you already know that. <laughs> and then the Lord said, let us study now about how to prepare for the journey. He said, are you ready? I said yes Lord so I quickly grabbed my notebook and I began to jot down everything the Lord told me how we should prepare for the journey so what I'm going to share with you to, uh, this morning at, at every of my session I'm going to share with you part one part two part three and the whole series I will entitle them the last last days remnant what the remnant should do how the remnant should prepare themselves in the journey that they are going to take and you'll be you'll be very surprised to know oh by the way before we go any further it's now quarter to 12 technically i should finish at one but i have a bad reputation <laughs> some call it good reputation I don't know when to stop is it okay with everybody yes. or do you want me to stop exactly at one no, no you all are wonderful saints <laughs> that does not mean I'm buying you lunch <laughs> so so we will uh, study part one part two part three and part four that will tell us together how we should prepare for the journey the journey is going to begin and we must prepare for the journey the journey that is going to begin will last throughout 
the reign of the Antichrist. Last throughout a wilderness survival when the mark of the beast will be introduced. So this is survival for the remnant, not for the masses. Because the masses, masses of Christianity is going to fall away. The Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, that in the last days there will come a great falling away. A great falling away. And the larger percentage of Christians will fall away and they will queue to take the mark of the beast. Or they will even apply online for the mark of the beast. You know, after this visit here, I'm going to go to South Carolina for another three days. And after South Carolina to Taiwan for uh, four days of uh, the Median Women's Prophetic Conference. So last, yesterday I received an email. You know, when you go to in each country, when you land at the airport, you are given a landing card, an arrival card to fill, right? You fill up the card and then you give it to the immigration officer. But I, yeah, the mail that I received yesterday was, fill up the arrival card online. So I thought that was so nice. So I fill up the arrival card to Taiwan online and fill up all my particulars. And they said, okay, well done, welcome to Taiwan. See? So technology is leaping more than we can keep up. So with this iris, scan technology today and with your fingerprinting you cannot go through any airport today in the world without your fingerprints being fingerprinted and your iris being scanned am i right everybody so all the data is there now the journey to survive in the wilderness and ultimately your journey ends not ends just temporarily it ends when the Lord Jesus comes back. And the journey continues. It doesn't end yet. It only ends after the 1,000 year millennium reign. Then the journey ends. And we all live happily forever and ever. But even during the millennial reign, the journey hasn't ended yet. You go through another phase in the journey. And at the end of the second phase, then you enter into a third phase of the journey, which will last for three and a half years, where we will have one last battle with the devil that will last for three and a half years. So that will be the third phase of the journey. And at the end of the third phase, then we live happily ever after, like the prince and princesses, you know. So, how do we prepare? And the Lord told me, you can learn this from how the Israelites were told to prepare for their journey. From Egypt, they were told to prepare for their journey in the wilderness and then journeying towards the promised land. Number one, the Israelites were told to prepare. Get ready. You are going to be set free. You are going to be delivered after 400 to 430 years of slavery and bondage. Finally, you are going to be set free. You are going to celebrate your independence. So get ready. Get ready. How were they told to get ready? The Lord God never leaves anything for imagination. Neither does he tell you, okay, you can just prepare anyhow you like, how do you want to prepare? He gave them clear instructions what to do. You know, when you want to walk with God, we must do things by the principles of the kingdom of God. You cannot make God in your own image. 
This is a cardinal law of the Ten Commandments. God said, don't make any image of God and worship. So we understood that that image means an idol. Perhaps that's one way of seeing it. But there are other applications to it in these modern times. Making image can also mean you forming a God or forming the God of Israel according to how you think he should be worshipped. Today, Christianity or going to church has become a, a worship of convenience. You, when there are multiple services, you choose when to go according to your convenience. That was not how it was stipulated by God. When the Lord introduced the seven feasts of the Lord for Israel to celebrate, He clearly told them, all males should appear before me three times a year. You don't pick and choose when you go. You come to meet God at His time, on His day, in a manner how He prescribes you to come and meet Him. Protocol is very, very important. However, in today's very loose, charismatic Christianity, we have formed images of God to our own liking. And we bow down and worship that God which we have created for ourselves. See, this is the reason why we don't see the Shekinah glory of God in our churches and we are not experiencing God, the tangible experience of God, because we have made an image for ourselves. We are clearly told, you don't make any image. The God whom you serve, the God whom you worship, should be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That is the plan prescribed by God. So when you bypass all this, and you form your own God, you form your own pattern of churchianity, and you try to worship God, then you're not worshipping the Lord God, you're just worshipping a golden calf that you have created. So every Sunday you're just bowing down to the golden calf, you're kissing the golden calf, you are giving your tithes and your contributions to the golden calf so that year after year more gold can be plated on the calf. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, we need to stop all that and come back to the basic of seeking God, worshipping Him in a manner that he wants you to worship him. So the first thing they were told, how to prepare. They were told to prepare. And the, under this sub-point of preparing, what were they told? Number one, they were told to prepare and eat a lamb. Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 to 6. They were told how to carefully prepare the lamb, how to dress the lamb, marinate the lamb, and then keep it for seven days, and on the seventh day, you eat the lamb. You don't eat it before. See, they were carefully told when to eat. Secondly, they were told, be fully clothed. Let your loins be girded and be fully dressed because the journey can begin anytime. The journey can begin anytime. So therefore, 
you must be fully dressed. Now that aligns with what the Apostle Paul counsels us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Put on the whole armor of God in the evil day. Do you all agree with me we are in the evil days? Yes. We don't need to wait for the future for, for evil day to manifest. It's already here. And the Apostle Paul says, put it on. You don't take it out and then put it on. It should be put on 24-7. Preparedness at all times. So they were told, be fully clothed. Let your loins be girded. Exodus chapter 12 verse 11. Why? Because the journey is going to begin. Now if you read 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 46. After the showdown on Mount Carmel, the prophet Elijah was going to go to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord is going to come upon him and he's going to run faster than the chariot of Ahab. And the Bible tells us he girded his loins. He girded himself because his journey is going to begin. A supernatural journey is going to begin. So you must be fully clothed. And the Bible also tells us in Luke chapter 12 verse 35, where the Lord Jesus counsels us, let your ways be girded and your lamps burning. Be girded, be prepared. Number three, shoes on your feet. They were, they were told to put on your shoes. First, prepare the lamb. Second, be fully dressed. Third, put on your shoes. Because the journey where you're going to go is a great journey. You don't suddenly put on your shoes. You have no time for all that. So put it on. Get ready. Now what does that represent? It represents for us to put on the shoes for preaching the gospel of peace. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15. But the scriptures also tells us that in the last days, when the last days come, we should preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. The gospel that we have been preaching these days is not the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel that we have been preaching these days is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is not the gospel of the kingdom. Now what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ came, he died, he rose again. Gospel of Jesus Christ unto salvation. But the gospel of the kingdom is Jesus Christ came, he died, he rose again, and he's coming back again. Not only he's coming back again, the kingdom of God is coming together with him. So when the kingdom comes, what will be effected? That is the gospel of the kingdom. And you will find that during the three and a half years of the Lord Jesus' ministry, he preached only the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom. In the first century, the disciples and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom. But after they were all gone, from that time till today, we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now why they preached the gospel of the kingdom in their times? The Lord Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then the end will come. So what is the sign that we are in the end? The gospel of the kingdom must be preached. So if this is the end, in the end times, then we must hasten preaching the gospel of the kingdom. 
the kingdom of God is coming. The good news, that is the good news. The kingdom of God is coming. If you study the four gospels, every parable that the Lord Jesus spoke, taught, and every message he preached, they were all centered around the gospel of the kingdom. That was what he was preaching. He was preparing the people of preaching that the kingdom of God is coming. So get ready. Get ready. So now in these end times, each and every one of us, every pastor, every evangelist, every believers, must first learn what is the gospel of the kingdom. Second, preach the gospel of the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God, when it is preached, it will be in a demonstration of power and glory. The reason why we don't see power and glory today is because we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And most of the gospel that we preach is the gospel of ourselves. The me, the me gospel. Have you heard of that? The I gospel. The me and the I gospel is what I can get from God. When I give money to the church, what dividends do I get? You, you have heard many preach, preaching like this. So, and you'll get a hundredfold harvest. Right? Have you heard of that? You see, so, so many people give with that greedy attitude in mind. So, so they are treating God as a big casino manager. When you play casino or you play that slot machine, I call it the one arm bandit. <laughs> because you only use one arm, right? It's a bandit because it sucks all your money. <laughs> so when you put money, you play you, the slot machine, you are hoping to get something back in return. So very sadly, there are many, many people who, when they give, they, they are treating the church as a gambling center. So many years ago, the Lord once appeared to me and he asked me a question. Besides praying for your partners, what else do you do? So I pondered for a long time. I said, Lord, I failed to write a monthly letter to my partners. I failed to hold a annual partners conference or meeting. I feel all that. The only thing I do was uh, pray for them. So I felt so convicted by this. So after this visitation, I wrote a letter to all our partners asking for their forgiveness because I did not communicate with them through a monthly or bi-monthly letter and did not have any partners gathering or meeting. So many of them wrote back, oh, we know you're so busy, it's okay, it doesn't matter. The most important was you were praying for us. And only one man wrote to me like this. He said, I don't care whether you pray for me or you don't pray for me. I don't care whether you write letters or you don't write letters. I don't care if you have time to meet us for conference or not. I only care one thing. I'm sowing into your ministry, I expect dividends. I expect that. That's all I care. So I replied him. I said, my dear brother, my ministry is not a gambling den. I did, I'm sorry to hear that you have treated our ministry as a gambling den. It is not. Please stop your giving. I don't need your offerings anymore. Give it to other gambling dens <laughs> where you can receive great dividends. I was so saddened when I read that letter. But that is the attitude many Christians have. You have that false attitude because there are so many false preachers and false teachers who have taught you that false gospel of prosperity. And that is why you have been duped into thinking that whatever you give, you must always get back in monetary means. Why must it always be in monetary means? 
God says he will give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, not necessarily money, you know. He keeping you healthy and well. That is a monetary blessing because you are not spending money with the doctors. You've got no medical bills to pay. So that's saved. And you will have provision. You and your family will always have food on the table. That's God's provision. So let's learn to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Number four. He said, have a staff in your hands. Now what does that mean? The staff they were told to take in their hands is not just a, a walking stick to help them walk in the wilderness. You know, if you've ever been to Egypt, the journey from Cairo up to the Israel border along the vast wilderness of sin is a flat terrain. Even in those olden days, they don't climb up the mountain, down the valley. It's a almost flat terrain. So you don't practically need a walking stick, the staff as a walking stick. But the staff doubled up as a weapon. They were told to take in their hands. Take the weapon in your hand, a staff. Because they are bandits along the way. They are the Amalekites and the Jebusites. All kinds of sites are there. <laughs> so you better have sight to see all those sites. <laughs> so take the weapon in your hand. Joel chapter 3 verse 10. We are told in the last days, Beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. And Joel chapter 3 verse 9 says, Prepare! Prepare for war! Two times you'll read it written there. Prepare for war. Prepare for war. So the shaft, the stuff that was used to lead and guide, now becomes a weapon. The plowshares and the pruning hooks that were used for farming, now the scripture says, convert them. Convert them into swords and spears because you have a war. You have a war in the last days. Number five. Now what the war is, we'll talk about it a little later on. Number five. Now, all Americans will love this number five. I think this is perfect for not only Americans, but the many, many other societies that are adopting this principle now. Eat in haste. <laughs> eat in haste. Eat quickly. Don't go to the diner, sit down and eat. Drive through. <laughs> Drive through. <laughs> See, I told you all Americans will love it. <laughs> See, I drive through. Eat in a hurry. Get a cup in a noodle. Drive and eat at the same time. <laughs> How in the world they do it, I don't know. Maybe you put it on cruise control and you eat and you drive at the same time. So eat in haste. Hurry, hasten. Hurry, hasten. Eat in haste. Number six. Go and get jewelries, gold, silver, and clothes from the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 12, verses 35 to 36. Now what God told them, how does it apply for us in this, our last day's journey? There is going to come a transference of wealth of the wicked, from the wicked to the righteous. 
a transference of wealth is going to take place. We see that here. All the wealth, the gold, the silver, and the very expensive clothes of the Egyptians were transferred to the Israelites. And they had a ton of all that when they left Egypt. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22, Isaiah chapter 60 verse 5 and 11, Nahum chapter 2 verse 9, and Zechariah chapter 14 verse 14, there's going to come a great transference of wealth. Now that does not mean you go and ask other people to will their wills to you. This is something supernatural that's going to take place. And I believe we are at the very threshold of this transference to take place. Now remember one thing, people of God. This transference of wealth is not for you to build your empire. Now why did God gave so much of gold and silver and all those expensive clothes to the Israelites. They are not going to have a fashion parade in the wilderness. No, right? They are not going to have any, uh, they are not going to wear nicely to attend any expensive restaurant in the wilderness. Right? So why? So that they can give it back to God in return. Because all the gold, all the silver, all the nice clothes are necessary for the building of the tabernacle. See? They freely receive the spoils from the Egyptians. And then, the amazing thing is this, you know. Each time when I read it, I'm just mystified by the great goodness of God. He told the prophet Moses... In Exodus chapter 25, verse 2, ask from the Israelites that they may give freely out of their hearts. See, God gives you liberally. And then he tells you, do you mind giving back to me? See, what a great good God. A wonderful great God of perfect gentlemanship. He's the one who gave you. He has the right to tell you or command you, give. Right? Yes. Instead of doing that, he said, do you mind? Do you mind? I have a need. Do you mind? Who would do that? See how good God is. So, therefore, when this great wealth comes, it is for two purposes. One, for the hastening of the work of God in the last days. Number two, to help the poor people. They are always the poor, the needy, the hungering, the homeless people, the widows. They are always there around you. Always. Even when the children of Israel settled down in the promised land, God told them, you will always have the poor in your midst. So when you glean your fields, leave one tenth for the poor. Don't touch that. Just leave it. And let not only the poor, you know, not only the poor among the Israelites, but even strangers. Strangers meaning non-Christians. Let them come and help themselves. So this tells me that we should do charitable works not only to Christians, but even to non-Christians. We should do charitable works because the Bible says God is good to all. Amen. Good to all. He makes the sun to shine on the good and on the wicked. See, he's very impartial. So when you stretch your hands, to give. We should give to all. Whether they are Hindus, they are Muslims, they are atheists, they are free thinkers or slave thinkers, whatever thinkers they are, or even if they don't think. 
Free thinkers, you know, I have come to understand one this. Free thinkers are really no thinkers. When you are free, you are no. You don't think anything. So they actually slave thinkers. Give liberally. But before God gives you this great wealth, He first tests you whether can you be trusted with this wealth. If you are not faithful in the small, in the little, how can you be trusted with great wealth? If you cannot use little, let's say give away 10 or 100 or thousands or 10 thousands now how can you be trusted to give away millions you'll never want to do that let me tell you a true narrative many years ago i was invited to speak at a small church in taiwan in the capital city taipei so the church could sit about maybe 150 or 200, but it was jam-packed that one-day service, 300 to 350. And they were, the church was too crowded that I only had standing space by the wall. So after the message, as I began to pray for the people, the Lord Jesus came and stood by my side, and he pointed his finger at one particular man. I could clearly see who the man was, and the Lord said, tell him he's a robber. So, I opened my eyes, and I looked at the man. He was a finely dressed man. He doesn't look like a robber. You know, robbers have certain classic way how they look like, right? <laughs> Not anymore, you know, those are the Old Testament. Those, those kind of dressing were all belong to that dinosaur age or the wild, wild west age. Today's thieves, you don't even see them. They operate in cyberspace. They operate online. Are you familiar with that? So I, look, I opened my eyes, I looked at him. He was such a fine gentleman, was kneeling down and wore a very nice looking expensive shirt. And he was, he had a very nice complexion that tells me that he's a very like a learned man and a, a fine gentleman. How can he be a robber? So then I also thought, okay, maybe, you know, when you come to church, you dress nicely. That's what most people do, right? Every other days on, on the week when they come to church, they are shabbily dressed. On Sunday, suddenly they all become princesses. Princesses and prince. I used to wonder why is it that only on Sundays you are very well dressed? Is it because God only comes on Sundays? <laughs> that during weekdays God doesn't come? A good food for you to think. God comes even during weekdays. So you must be dressed nicely to meet Him on a weekday, not just on a Sunday. Anyway, come back to this story. So I thought, maybe this guy is going to steal all the handbags that these women have left behind. So I kept my eyes open <laughs> to see if he will just sneak and steal from the woman's handbags when everybody were, their eyes were all tightly shut. Because I tell them, now don't open your eyes and see. So they are tightly shut, no one dares to open. And I, but the longer I looked at him, the more sincerely he was praying. So he cannot be a thief. So why did, why did the Lord say he's a robber? So I asked the Lord, Lord, you must give me more information. Why is he a robber? I cannot just simply tell him he's a robber. So the Lord began to show me about his life. This man was a businessman, or is a businessman. When he first came to Taipei, the capital city, to start a business, he made a covenant with the Lord. Lord, you are my business partner. Whatever I make, a tenth I will give to you. So that was the deal. 
So when he made his first 1,000, he very happily gave the Lord a hundred. And then when he made his first 10,000, he very happily gave the Lord 8,000. And then when he made his first 100,000, he very happily gave to the Lord 10,000. And then when he made his first million, oops, 100,000 is too much. Why does God need 100,000 for? <laughs> so he began to reason himself. And then he said, Lord, your word says all the cattle and all the cows on a, belongs to you. And all the gold, all the silver in this world belongs to you. Why do you need this money? You don't need this money, Lord. So he stopped giving. So he held back that 100,000. But yet God blessed him. From a million, he made 10 million. And he held back that 1 million, right? Now your touch is 1 million. For several, I think, months or maybe a year or two, he held back every penny of his tithes. So the Lord said, now tell him, he has stolen my money. And he is a robber. Tell him that. So I said, there is a robber in our midst. <laughs> Can you imagine what everybody would have seen, felt? Instantly, I noticed the pastor opened his eyes and he looked around. <laughs> Pastors like to know, you know. And uh, so the Lord told me, he said, tell him, today is his last chance. If, if he will not repent today, then I'm going to take away everything from him. And he will be back in the streets like how he was before. So today is his last chance. So very lovingly, I coaxed him to repent. Oh, he was seated on his chair. And uh, so he wasn't willing to repent, you know. In, in fact, he will be looking around, who is the robber? <laughs> so finally, to help him repent, I said, if you're not going to repent right now, I'm going to call out your name for the whole church to know who you really are. And even then, he, he was just stubborn. So finally I said, okay, if you're not going to stand up, this is your last chance. If you're not going to repent right now, I'm going to come right up to you, pull you by your ear, <laughs> and say, you are the robber. So the moment I said that, he knelt down. And he totally repented. You see, if you are like that, how can God trust you with greater wealth? Amen. See, when there's going to come a great transfer of wealth, you cannot imagine how much of wealth of the wicked are going to come into the hands of the righteous people. You, you cannot imagine there's going to come a great transfer. And we should be a people of good stewards. So that was a test for the Israelites. And when they were told to give, the Bible tells us every one of them generously gave. And the Lord, because of that, He prospered them. Now what is the one important principle we learn here, the first important preparation for a journey begins with a covenant relationship with God. That's the first thing, a covenant relationship. Now, where did the covenant relationship came from? From the lamb that they ate. See, the lamb, you all know very well, it symbolizes the Lord Jesus Christ. Eating his flesh... And drinking his blood is a covenant relationship. So, when you want to begin this journey, you don't just have a religion. Our dear brother Bobby Connor touched on this last night. Not religion, a relation. Which is missing very much today. We have 
a lot of religion. Now religion comes in another form. A lot of conferences. Online and offline. This is, you all seated here are offline. Those who are not here watching on the internet are online. Not only are they watching this conference online, they are also watching this on all of our networks around the world. This is also televised live on Angel TV all over the world right now. So, there are many, many, you know, it is not wrong for you to go from conference to conference. Or you are a YouTuber. Are you a YouTuber? Okay, there is now a new church community called the YouTube community. So there are many, many wonderful signs. Even Bobby said that 23,000 of your messages all on YouTube. Why people are attending the YouTube church? Because they are tired of their own church or their dead churches. So because everything is dead and rusty, you end up on a YouTube church. Am I right? Okay. Nothing wrong. But you must know how to filter the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's one big problem. We do not know how to filter the bad and the ugly. So you end up swallowing every ugly thing. Okay, besides that, now let me ask you one honest question. What have you really done with all the eating? What have you done? How much has your life progressed spiritually? How much has it progressed attending one conference after another conference? Hearing this message, one message after another message after another message, like a non-stop serial. What, how has your life transformed? What good it is if you devour everything, but if your life is not transformed? What good? What good? The Apostle Paul says, if I can speak in all the languages of men, in all the languages of angels, what good if I don't have love? What good is it? I can understand why the Apostle Paul wrote that, you know. Because in, in the many, many visitations that I've had with angels of God and the saints of God, the one remarkable characteristic I found in them is great humility and great love. So having seen all that, the Apostle Paul says, what good is it? If I have all this knowledge, all this wisdom, I can work all the signs and wonders, but if I don't have love, what good is it? So, you hearing all the messages on YouTube, attending all the conferences, what good is it if your life is not transformed? What good is it? You just have your head fattened. That's all. Like a fretted cow. That's all. Don't laugh. This is not funny. I'm saying this to provoke you to think and to do something. You cannot just be a learner in these last days anymore. Because the journey is going to begin. When the journey is going to begin, you must be a practitioner. A practitioner who practices what you have been told, what you have been taught, and get ready for the journey. Without a covenant relationship with God, you cannot survive this last day's journey. It's not a covenant relationship with a ministry. Good for you to be in a covenant relationship as a partner with a church, as a ministry, all that is good. The pastors can pray for you, the ministers can pray for you, they can invite you to their conferences, all that is good. But at the end of the day, they are still men. 
please keep that in mind. They are men prone to fall. Because it's still flesh, you know. As long as the flesh is flesh, they can fall. They are not infallible. But it's most important for you to have a covenant relationship with God. That is your only survival thing that will help you to survive in the last days. When everybody has forsaken you, only the Lord will be with you. So for Him to be with you, then you must have a strong covenant relationship with God. Everybody else can forsake you. The people whom you trust the most can let you down. And you can be all alone. The Saint Job said like this, When I sit in darkness all alone, the Lord will be light all around me. So, he was able to say that because of his covenant relationship. And in these last days, the remnant need to have this covenant relationship. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. In Revelation chapter 12 verse 11, that is based on a covenant relationship the last days remnant had that enabled them to survive in the last days. Number two, the second important preparation for journey, sanctification. Exodus chapter 13 verse 2, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Consecrate or sanctif sanctify means set apart for God. Set it apart. When you set something apart for God, it becomes a holy thing. If it becomes a holy thing, it cannot be misused. Even for your own personal things. Set apart. That brings us to the realization that you don't belong to yourself. Please let that sink into you. You don't belong to yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says, You were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. This morning as I was preparing this message, the scripture suddenly made a new meaning to me. I began to meditate it deeply. You were bought with a price. If you're bought with a price, the owner who paid the price has full authority, ownership of you. You don't own yourself anymore. The person who paid the price for you, he owns you now. You are not a boss anymore. You are a slave. If you are a slave, this is what Pastor Joe Smith was touching this morning, I believe. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So you are not you or not yours. If you are not yours, and you are a slave, how can you run your life by yourself? How can you decide for yourself? Tell me, how can you decide for yourself? You cannot, because you have been bought. You are not yours. You have been bought with a price. So why is it that we have been running our lives by ourselves all this while? So this must stop today. Amen. 
you are not yours anymore. Let that sink into you. This afternoon, when there are no meetings, meditate this. You are not yours. My hope for you is, before you leave this conference, you will be a changed and transformed person. Whether you get a healing or not, which you will certainly get, whether you get that or not, whether you get any of your other prayers answered or not, my hope for you is, and my prayer for you, that your lives will be transformed. Amen. Your mind will be renewed. Amen. And you will walk out of this place a changed, transformed, transfigured person. Amen. And when you walk out, you are ready to begin your journey Amen. towards the promised land. You are, you are ready for the end times. That should be your goal. When you set your priorities right, seeking first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, then the Lord Jesus promises all these other things that you need for your natural life, food to eat, clothes to wear, they will be provided to you automatically. You don't have to seek after them. They will follow. Because the Bible says, your father knows that you have need of all these. Your father knows. Since your father knows and he has promised to provide for you, why are you fretting after them? Why are we slotting day and night for perishable bread and butter? You are working so hard day and night to save up paper. Right? It's paper, you know. Green color paper. Why? That paper can be burned. That paper can be torn. That paper can be lost. We work so hard for all these fanciful clothes that can become moth-eaten. Why? And then you miss the biggest thing of all, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You miss all that. This is what the Lord Jesus told the Pharisees, you know. You tight the cumin seed, you tight this, you tight that, but you have missed the weightier matter of the law. You have missed it. You are so careful in the small, small details. You miss the bigger picture. The bigger picture is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the first commandment. Seeking first the kingdom of God. And then the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what the Lord Jesus says, and all his righteousness, doing good. On, on these two hang all the law. Everything else hangs on these two. And the Apostle Paul went a step further to summarize the two greatest commandments with just one word. He said, love fulfills the law. One word. See, from ten became two, and from two became just one word, love. Which is the law in heaven. But... To explain to little kids, the Lord God told them ten, gave them ten commandments, which is actually the word love. So when these little children grew a little older, from un being under the schoolmaster, they became now in a high school. So now the Lord Jesus summarized the ten commandments and gave them two commandments. And now they grown a little older, now there have been many other mysteries of the church age were shown to them, taught to them, so now the Apostle Paul gave them, revealed the one most important cardinal principle, cardinal law in the kingdom of God, love. Without love, nothing works. 
Without love, you cannot even stand before the Almighty God. Remember this, people of God. You, you, we can win the whole world, but if you have no love, then everything is a great waste. Everything is a great waste. You can escape the mark of the beast. You can escape all these things. At the end of the day, when you stand before God, He will only ask you one question. Or even before God, there will be other protocol, you know. The angels, when they wet your application, the one question they ask you is this, actually two questions. The first question, have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? You cannot answer yes. You cannot do that because no lies are allowed. No lies allowed. Not only no lies are allowed, you cannot even lie. When you stand there, you can only speak the truth. And the and if you cannot answer, and if you hung down your head in shame, you know, the angels are so nice, you know. They don't condemn you. They just point their finger to the left side. Please go there. <laughs> the left side. Very gentle. See, I told you, they all are full of love. They, they don't tell you, go to hell. No. <laughs> they don't. They're so nice. They just point a finger to the left. And then demons will come and drag you to hell. But if you say yes, then they point the finger to the right side. Then the angels will come and welcome you to enter into the joy of the Father. Now one of my staff, she was clinically dead for two minutes. She and her husband, they, they met with a terrible accident. Their car was totaled. And she and her husband were badly injured, miraculously. Her one-year-old son did not have a, had a single scratch on his body. That little boy was supernaturally protected. So when she died, she and her husband stood at the gates of heaven. Though she could see that her husband was standing by her side, she also knew at that moment that she can't answer for him and neither could he answer for her. They are both individuals. So they came and stood there, and there were many other people before her. And the, there was an angel, and he asked them one question. Have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? First question. Second question, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? So there were many people who could not answer. The angel pointed his finger that way, sir. So they were all dragged to hell. Then... She, she came and stood there. And the angel asked her the same question. Before she could say anything, the sins of her life were played out on video screens. Just like the video screens that you see here. Not just only on two sides, but 360 degrees. All looking at every one of them. They were all her unconfessed sins. The sins that have been confessed and forgiven, they will not be displayed anymore because hard disk is deleted. But those that you thought they were inconsequential, or those that you did not with all your heart repented, you just simply repented, but not with all your heart, then they all are displayed. So when she saw all that, you know, this girl, she worked for me. She is the number one miser in our ministry. She's the stingiest person. And all our staffs can wow chef for that. She's so stingy, very arrogant, very proud. And she will, it's so difficult for her to give a dime or even a penny to a poor person. She's that kind of a nature. And uh, she fell on her face and she cried and she cried and she cried. And she asked God, Lord, give me one chance, one more chance. 
and behind the angel on a huge high and mighty throne she saw the lord jesus christ seated but she could not see his face she, she saw a glorious being seated and she cried and she cried and she cried and then came a thunder like voice from the throne go back the next moment she opened her eyes and the paramedics were working on her and she had to go through many surgeries she and her husband and they, when she came out of the surgery and she was discharged from the hospital instead of going home she came straight to see me and she fell at my feet and she cried and she cried and she cried and repenting of all her many sins and then she narrated this incident to me and the most remarkable thing i saw in her life after that was she was a changed person she became the most kindest the most generous and the most lovable person in our entire ministry she whenever there is a lack she will be the first person to help see a life dramatically change with one heavenly encounter this is the fruit of a true encounter today so many people have so many spiritual encounters but their lives are not changed actually their lives have been changed head puffed up that is a change right even the head puffing up with pride is also a change ne negative change so you are not yours for you to live like yourselves you are bought with a price therefore the bible tells us in first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 7 and chapter 5 verse 23 it calls for holy living you are called to live a holy lives and we were told god tells them remember you came out of bondage in exodus chapter 13 verse 3 you came out of bondage what does that mean you have been set free from sin romans chapter 3 sorry romans chapter 6 verse 22 you have been set free from sin that is the house of egypt your bondage you have been set free when you are set free you should no more be slaves of sin rather romans 6:20 says you should be slaves of righteousness no more yield your members to unrighteousness but yielding your members to righteousness you know i meditated this for a long time this morning and finally i found a key how to live a life without sinning knowingly or unknowingly the key is in this to know that you have been bought with a price you are not you anymore you are not you you don't belong to you anymore the husband doesn't belong to his wife the wife doesn't belong to the husband the children don't belong to the parents the parents don't belong to the children you don't belong to anyone you belong only to the lord jesus that doesn't mean you go and tell your husband you i don't belong to you anymore so goodbye <laughs> no that doesn't mean that okay the bible says god hates divorces amen there is no other way of maneuvering around there unless you know there are some other option we will not go into that subject anyway remember this the key to live a life without sinning is to keep before your eyes the thought you are not yours you're bought with a price you're bought with a price let that sink inside you i am not yours i'm bought with a price when that sinks inside you then the realization will come So if you are bought with a price you have a master and the master has the rights over you 
So your hand is now a slave to the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot, your hand is no more yours to cause it to sin as you like. You cannot do that anymore. The eyes, you cannot see sinful things because the eyes have been bought with a price. There is a master who owns your eyes now. You cannot use your eyes for other purposes. Let me share with you this one uh, supernatural experience I had in the year 2011. In the year 2011, during the Yom Kippur days, we used to have a conference in India. And a day before the conference, while I was waiting on God, I had a visitation from one of the four living creatures in heaven that looked like a lion. So he came and stood before me and he spoke to me and gave me some counsels and some instructions how I should govern my life from this moment onwards for the new journey that I'm going to take in my ministry. And after that being left, the Lord Jesus Christ came and said to me, He said, now you have entered into a new phase in your life. And now you, I have sent these heavenly beings to be with you. Therefore, you must live a life of greater holiness. You cannot simply go to any place you like anymore because they will be repulsive to these heavenly creatures. Let me give you a good example. In Jericho, uh, not Jericho, Joshua chapter 5, when an angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army, came and stood before Joshua, and the first thing he told Joshua was, remove your shoes. You are standing in holy ground. So it's like that. So they are holy beings who come to work together with you. So we cannot live our lives like anyhow. If you want to walk together with heaven, then your lifestyle must align with heaven, not heaven align with you. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, how can two walk together if they be not agreed? So if you want to walk with heaven, work together with the heavenly army, then our lives must align, altered, change, to align with heavenly's, heaven's principles. And the third thing, they were told to sanctify. Exodus chapter 13 verse 3, they were told not to eat any leavened bread. Don't eat any leavened bread, you're only supposed to eat unleavened bread. Now what does leaven mean? The Lord Jesus explained in Luke chapter 12 verse 1, leaven signifies an old life or hypocrisy. And the Lord and the word of God also counsels us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with all leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So look at this. The leaven means or signifies, number one, hypocrisy. Number two, malice. Number three, wickedness. So these three, you must put away from your life. Don't eat them anymore. Instead, you are supposed to eat only unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. From this day, purpose in your life, that you are going to walk in sincerity. You are going to be a person of sincerity. And you are going to only speak the truth. And you'll be a person of truth. Now, after these two preparations, what happened next? Number three, 
there was supernatural guidance from God. In Exodus chapter 13 verse 18 says, God himself guided them. In the journey that you are going to embark in these last days, history will repeat itself again. It was never the will of God for kings and queens and princesses to guide the children of Israel. God himself wanted to be their king and to lead them and guide them. But they chose to be like everybody else. Now listen, people of God. The uppermost best of God for you is to be guided by himself. But the people wanted to be like everybody else. I don't want to be peculiar. I don't want to be special. I just want to be ordinary. Let me be like everybody else. Let me be like the Canaanites. Let me be like the Jebusites. Let me be like the Amalekites. Let me be like this. Let me be like that. God wanted to, you to be seated with him on his right side. But you wanted to be down there in hell. God wanted you to soar like an eagle. But you wanted to be like a turkey. Isn't it? His, up, his best for you is to be like an eagle soaring in the heavenlies. But you choose, you want to be like a turkey. Just walking on the ground, feeding in all the filth and all the dirt that your eyes can find. Why? This is how your life has been till now. So now God is pulling you out. So, how does that relate to us in these present times? God wants to lead you by himself. But instead of you learning how to be led by God, you want prophets to lead you. You want other ministers to lead you and guide you. And they will lead you and guide you into the ditch. They milk you. Right? Have you seen how, how cows are milk? You've never seen? Oh, you poor thing. You must all come to India and see how cows are milk. And you are been milk of all your riches because you foolishly allow yourselves to be led by kings and princesses when God himself wants to lead you and guide you. When God wants to talk to you directly, why are you contented to only listen to the voice of a man? Yeah. Now that does not mean you stop coming to conferences in Lancaster. <laughs> that doesn't mean that. Remember, you come here every year. Okay? <laughs> Once a year in August, confirmed. But many times other, during the year, please come often as possible. However, at other times, God wants to talk to you directly. Because you are his son. You are his daughter. He is your father. What good is a family relationship if they are not talking to each other? How can it be a family? Am I right? How can it be a family? If a husband and wife are not talking to each other, something's wrong. Something's wrong, terribly wrong. The very core that has bounded them has rotten. And the very bone that bounded them has been broken. The cord of love has been broken, gone to waste. So there's no more bonding anymore. In the same manner, God is your father. You are his sons, you are his children. There must be communication. God wants to talk to you directly. And if you read in Exodus chapter 13 verse 17, he says like this, Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, 
that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now this means God wants to lead you gently like a shepherd. He knows you cannot endure war. Some can, many cannot. That is why some people, the Lord allows them to die early. He just takes them home. He knows they cannot endure what is going to come in the last days. They cannot endure and they will fall to sin and lose their soul. So the Lord allows a death to come. So that may come in the form of you are sick, your prayers are not heard for healing. You die. And you think why God didn't want to heal you. You know, there are many, many reasons. I always believe beyond a, a shadow of doubt, God is a good God. I am convinced beyond a shadow of doubt. He, no matter what happens, even if something is broken, a relationship is broken, God is still a good God. I don't understand why it broke. I don't understand why it failed. But that's not going to alter my faith in God, my trust in God, my call in God. I'm still going to keep on walking. I'm still keep on trusting. I'm still going to keep on following Him. He's still a good God who seated on the throne. Amen! I don't understand. I don't understand. I cannot see from my earthly point of view. But God sees. God sees. What can happen if this continues? So He causes a break. He allows a break to come. He puts or He allows a stumbling block to come. Let me tell you this story. Do you like stories? Yeah. Okay. This is a real one. <laughs> the reason why I say real one is because some are parables. So when I say real one, it means a real incident. So there was this man of God living in a remote, beautiful place in India. And he came out one morning with a cup of tea in his hand. And as he was looking at the beautiful mountains and the valleys, he saw on a tree a bird building a nest. So every day he would just look at that bird laboriously building a nest. And many days pass by and the nest is now almost complete. Then every day this man of God will stand by the door and just drink his tea and look at the nest. As the nest was nearing completion, suddenly he realized that he was not the only one who has been observing the nest, there was someone else, a big fat cat, <laughs> Garfield. <laughs> Garfield was also, you know Garfield, don't you? You cannot be an American if you do not know Garfield. So Garfield was standing by a corner, and he too was patiently looking at the bird building the nest, like a cameraman from National Geographic Channel. <laughs> at first, the man of God thought, okay, this Garfield is also learning how to build a nest. So he went into his house. Then something struck his mind. He came out. He looked at the cat again. Oh, oh. This Garfield is not learning how to build a nest. The Garfield is waiting for the nest to be completed and the bird to lay the eggs and then the eggs to hatch and then he will say, thank you Lord for the dinner. <laughs> so when the man of God saw all this, he realized all this, so he thought of a plan. Now, he not only need to save those two birds, but to save a generation. It's not just the two eggs, you know. 
the 2x can become 4x and the 4x can become 8x. It's a whole generation, a lineage. So he waited for a good opportunity for those two birds to fly away. Then he climbed up the tree, took a big stone and put it in the center of the nest. And he, came, climbed, he climbed down. And after some time, these two birds, the mother and the father, mother, father, keep that in your mind. <laughs> mother, father, male, female, mother, father. You, you understand? Yeah. Okay. See, you all are too wise. A mother and father can only be male, female. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, they came back and they were furious to see their nest damaged. Oh, the poor birds were flying around the nest and crying so loudly. And for at least 10 minutes, they went around and around the nest crying and crying and crying and scolding the person who did this evil work. So they were so heartbroken. All their efforts were wasted. And they flew away to another tree. Now, the bird only saw the stone in the nest. The bird did not see big fat garfield. The bird could not see that when the eggs are hatched, this garfield is going to wipe out their entire generation, like Haman, waiting to wipe out the whole race of the Jews. The bird couldn't see. The bird only saw the problem. The bird couldn't see the larger picture. But the man of God saw the larger picture. And it was he who put the stone. Because he saw the danger. If you continue in this life, you'll be gone. You'll be dead. You'll come to nothing. Your call will come to nothing. Your life will come to nothing. Your anointing will be dissipated. So God put a stumbling block. Let this be broken. Let it be broken. See, sometimes we don't understand. We can't see. We only have hindsight. We don't have foresight. We can't see. But I counsel you today, trust in the good God. No matter what happens, good, bad or ugly, God is a good God. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. He's a good God. That is why the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Out of all the trials, the difficulties that you will face, He knows how to deliver you. Therefore, what should we do? We should pray. Lord, protect me. Take care of me. And not only the Lord guided them, the Bible says He also went before them. Exodus chapter 13 verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. See how good God is. He will lead you, He will guide you, and will enlighten you. Lead you, guide you, enlighten you, so that no evil befalls you. Number four, when they thought all was over and they are out of bondage, Pharaoh came with an army to capture and enslave them again. Exodus chapter 14, verses 5 to 9. A big problem came. Just when you thought all hell has been bounded and the devil has been bounded and cast into the bottomless pit, suddenly he has been released again. All hell breaks loose on you. <coughs> so what is the goal? The goal of the enemy is to come and ensnare and entrap you back to Egypt. The old ways of sin 
and the whole life of bondage. That is the goal of the enemy, to entrap you back, to cause you to think that your deliverance is not complete, to cause you a false security to come upon you, that your healing is not complete, your deliverance is not complete, all the promises that God gave you will not come to pass. A seeming failure in your life will be blown up by the enemy to cause you to doubt his best for your future or the new things that are going to happen in your life. In such an atmosphere, what did the Israelites do? Exodus chapter 14 verse 10 says, they cried out to God. And yesterday we heard a wonderful definition from Bobby Corner about what it means to cry unto God. You remember that? Yes. It's not just simply God, just simple crying. Tearing your heart and crying until there are no more tears. Crying out to God. That's what they did. What should we do? Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 says, pray for deliverance. You pray for deliverance. That is a prayer that the Lord Jesus prayed for you and is praying for you. John chapter 17 verse 15. The Lord Jesus prayed, Lord, Father, keep them away from the evil one. The Lord Jesus is praying that prayer for you every day. So you pray to pray for deliverance. Protect me from the evil one. And when they cried out to God, Exodus chapter 14 Verse 16 and verses 21 to 22 says, God supernaturally delivered them by parting the Red Sea. So there will always be a supernatural deliverance in your life. Always. Whenever you face a roadblock in your journey, cardinal rule, don't figure out what to do with your natural mind. Don't do that. Bend your knees, fast and pray, cry out to God for deliverance. And when you do, He will make a way where there's no way. Amen. Amen. Now, when they walk into, through the waters, here comes the third important preparation in the journey. That is a baptism. Now, what does this baptism signifies? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2 says, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So, what is baptism? Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says, We are baptized into the Lord Jesus' death. So, and what does it really mean to be baptized with the Lord Jesus' death? Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says that we were, you know, when you're baptized, you not only died, but you are buried. Sometimes, you know, when most people don't die, they are only in a coma. When you are in a coma, you can be revived, right? Your old life comes back. So, God is very wise. He knows that many people don't die. They're only in coma. So what does he do? He buries you. When you're buried, you are certain to die. So remember, in, in baptism, you, you not only die with the Lord Jesus, but you are even buried if you are buried, that is certain death. Certain death. If it is certain death, you don't live anymore. When you don't live anymore, how can yourself be alive? You don't live anymore. So, the self of your pride, the self of your greed, the self of your arrogance, they're all buried down there. 
if they are buried down there, then you are no more alive. You are no more alive. Please allow this truth to sink inside you. You must allow this to sink. Don't just store it here. Let it sink into you. When it sink into you, then you will truly live Galatians 2.20 life. The life that I live is no longer I that lives. See, the eye has already died, buried there. Now you live by the resurrected life of the Lord Jesus. Newness of life. That's what the scriptures mean. Now you don't live a normal life anymore. Romans 6, 6 says, you now live and walk in newness of life and don't serve sin anymore. Number five. Saying all this, then the Lord Jesus looked at me and he said, When I lead, I will provide. When I lead my children, when I lead my sons and daughters, I will provide for them. So that speaks of supernatural provision. A supernatural provision. Now we read of that in two incidences in the early part of the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 16, we read manna fell down from heaven. And Psalm 78 verse 25 says, manna is angel's food. So they were eating day and night, two times a day, angel's food. And secondly, when they were thirsty of water, Exodus chapter 17 Verses 1 to 6 said, the Lord miraculously provided them water. So their bread and their water was provided for them. This is the same promise God makes to the last day's remnant people. In Isaiah chapter 33 verse 16, he promises your bread and your water will be surely provided for you. How it comes? You don't need to worry about it. I firmly believe with all my heart. Because this is what I have been made to know. As it was, it, as it was, it happened to the Israelites one more time. God will repeat it by raining down manna from heaven for the last day's remnant. And I saw this vision, you know, when the Lord gave me the revelation about the last day's seven horns anointing. I've written a book there. That the last day's people will even command the earth to open up and water jutting out like a fountain. Water coming out from rocks. This will be repeated again in the last days. Because God is going to not just leave you alone. He's going to give you the powers of the age to come. Yeah. You are not alone. He will give you that power. He will pour that anointing oil of the seven horns of the Lamb upon your life. Where you will work these miracles. Now if you read Exodus 14 very carefully. When they were at the mouth of the Red Sea. The children of Israel cried out to God and so did Moses. So the Lord looked at him and he said, Why are you crying to me? Go and stand before the sea. Stretch out your rod and part the waters. You know, I have read that passage thousands of times. But today I saw something new. Which escaped my eyes all these 39 years of my life. Don't laugh. You also have that experience. <laughs> right? You have that experience too. You may have read the same scripture hundreds of times. Suddenly you find something new. That has escaped your eyes. Even one small word. And that suddenly jumps up. And tells you, you fool. I'm here all the while. Anyway, the word that I saw was. The Lord told him. 
you divide the waters. You do. It's not God who did it. God told him, you do it. You have the rod of God in your hands. Use it and do it. You have the name of the Lord Jesus in you, in your mouth. Do it. Speak the word. Speak the word. And you work the miracle. You speak the word. Don't sit down and cry. Don't sit down and cry because something that is precious has broken. Speak the word. Part the Red Sea. A new beginning opens for you. Don't sit down and cry over the dead pot, the broken pot. Leave it alone. Walk with newness of life. You work it. Not God is going to do for you. You do it. The Lord told Moses, I, the rod that's in your hand is my rod. See, what was once upon a time the rod of Moses, but it was transformed and it's called the rod of God. No more rod of Moses. So you have that in your hands. Do it! You have the name of Jesus in your lips. Right? You have it. It's inside you and it's on your mouth. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. Part the waters. Part the waters. Speak the word. In the last days, during the tribulation days, the remnant will suffer hunger, thirst, the sun will beat upon them, but the Lamb of God will be in your midst to lead you, to guide you, and to provide for you. Revelation chapter 7 verse 17. Number 6. We are nearing the end now. Not the end of the journey, the end of my message. <laughs> Number six. In the journey, now everything is not going to be rosy, you know. Israelites encountered enemies. Another new enemy came up. One enemy gone, another new enemy came in the form of the Amalekites. Exodus chapter 17 verse 8. So what are they going to do with the Amalekites? God told Moses, go to war. Now this is something very interesting, you know. In Exodus chapter 14 verses 12 to 14, God told Moses, I will fight for you. But now, here they were told, you go and fight. So, from chapter 14 to chapter 17, they have grown a little. They have matured. So now they can fight for themselves. In the same manner, the Bible tells us that there is a war for the last day's remnant in the end times. Revelation chapter 11 verse 7, chapter 12 verse 17 and chapter 13 verse 7 says, The beasts will make war with the remnant and with the saints of God. And the word war in the Greek is not a spiritual war. It talks about a natural war. There's a war. If there were no resistance by the remnant, why make a war? Right? Right? If, you are, if we are all like lambs ready to be brought to the slaughterhouse, the scripture would say, and the beast came and arrested the remnant. Right, everybody? Yes. But the scripture says, he made war. So for him to make war, it is like Star Wars, you know? You watch Star Wars movies? Yes. <laughs> you poor people. You are too holy. They make war just two days ago. Now you all have you all have heard about Brother Neville Johnson, yeah. right? Now his son, he's got only one son. He he 
he visited Pastor Sweet in Lancaster. And uh, when I heard that he was in town, we met for a cup of tea. So while we were talking, I, I asked him, so what are you doing now? What is God preparing you for? And he told me something very interesting, quite in line with what God has been using me to do. The thing was, God was teaching him, training him to raise up an army of the remnant for a last day's walk. And he had had visitations from the Saint David to teach him how to war. And the Lord him, I'm going to, the Lord told him, I'm going to teach you and prepare you so that you can train the remnant to war. It's going to be a real war. It's not a spiritual war. It, it's going to take place in both realms at the same time. Spiritual realm and earthly realm at the same time. That's why the scripture says, the beast made war with the remnant. So, you know, the simple word war tells you there's going to be resistance on both sides. Eventually, one will overcome the other. That we see that in the scriptures. But there is a war. This the Lord told us six years ago. He said, prepare my army. And for the last six years, we have been doing many youth camp meetings and teaching the young people the art of war. And I have had many wonderful visitations from angels, the warrior ones, who teach the art of spiritual war, or the war that has been conducted in the heavenly realm. And many, many of the weapons that are kept in heaven. I once had the blessed privilege to see the armory in heaven, and how weapons are made in heaven that make them so invincible to anything that is modern in this world. So all these are for a future great war that's going to come. So what do we do? Learn the art of spiritual warfare with heavenly army. Exodus chapter 9, sorry, Exodus chapter 17, verses 9 to 13. You will read that God told Moses what to do. So Moses called Joshua and said, okay, you gather the Israelites and go for war with the Amalekites while I go up on a mountain and I lift up my hands while you fight the war. So Moses stood on the mount and he lifted up his hand and Israel was winning the war. Then you know, no matter how much you lift up your hand, you will get tired. You'll want to bring your hand down, right? Poor Moses did not know the art of lifting up of hands like how modern charismatics do today. Today, modern charismatics, instead of doing this, they only do. <laughs> Have you seen that? That's all. If you do this way, you can stand for hours. But poor Moses did not know that. He only knew the biblical method. Stretching out your full hands. Not this way. Only those who are paralyzed can do this. Are you paralyzed, folks? No. If you're not paralyzed, then you should stretch out your hands. The proper biblical way of lifting up holy hands to worship God. So when he lifted up his hands, Israel was winning the war. And when he let down his hand, Joshua noticed, so did, sorry, not Joshua, Aaron and Ur noticed that Israel was losing the war. So they found a connection between Moses' hands being lifted up and the war that was going on. So these two men quickly thought of a plan. They didn't wait to be told. They took an initiative. See, that's what armor bearers and assistants in the church are supposed to be. You, as the saying goes, you think on your feet. You don't wait to be told by the pastor, okay, take this pot of plant and move to this place. You don't wait to be told. You know, you should know what to do, right? So immediately, they rolled a boulder, big rock, 
and made Moses sit down and they held up his hand till the war was over. You know, for a long time, for many times, I didn't understand what is the connection. I could know, okay, something spiritual takes place. But why that particular posture? How does that posture help in the war? It was only recently the Lord explained to me, Moses lifting up his hand is like how a lightning conductor is found on the rooftop of every house. We've seen a lightning conductor. It guides lightning down to the earth. In the same way, when he lifted up his hand, he was a lightning conductor that opened a portal for the heavenly army to come through to release the power of God to effect upon the Israelites to win the war. So, you are a participator in the last day's army of God. Now, let me show this concretely. Please turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. I would like to study this in greater detail so that you can understand this very well. You must know this very well so that you can be a participator and not a spectator. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Okay, let's pause here. There is a war here. And in every war, there are two camps. Camp number one. Hello? Hello. Camp number one. Michael and his angels. Camp number two. The dragon and his angels. Please keep that in your mind. Don't forget. Verse 8. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So you have one camp, Michael and his angels, fighting against the devil and his angels. And in the war, the devil was rooted out, and he was cast down to earth. Am I right, everybody? Yes. So, who won the war? Okay, are you sure? Yes. Okay, please keep your answer in your heart. Now let's continue. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now my question is this. You all told me that it was the angels who fought, and they won. Why would the angels need the blood of the Lamb? Tell me please. Why do they need the blood of the Lamb? The blood of the Lamb is not shed for the angels. Everybody agrees? Yes. It's not shed for them. This, this is problem number one. Now problem number two. And by the word of their testimony. Now why do the angels need a word of testimony? They don't need that. Right? right. They don't need that. This is problem number two. Problem number three. And they love not their lives to the death. Can angels die? No. no. So the angels cannot die. They don't need the blood of the lamb. They don't need the word of the testimony. Then who are this day? Who are this day who overcame? Now before you answer, remember what you answered me earlier. You said it was the angels who fought. Now, so keep this answer in your mind. Now you tell me, who are this day? We are. We are. are you sure? Yes. If this we are the day, 
but it was the angels who fought. So this tells you there is a war in the heavenly and the war in the earthly at the same time, simultaneously. So you are going to be like Moses, who was lifting up his hands and fighting together with Michael and his angels. Amen. Amen. Good place to clap your hands. That is why the Bible says, turn your pruning hooks into a sword and a spear. Get ready. Prepare. Prepare for war. Prepare for war. Now, who are the Amalekites? Amalekites are hindrances that prevent you from coming to meet with the Lord Jesus completely. They are those hindrances that will prevent you from attaining your sonship. They are the hindrances that prevent you from attaining the maturity so that you will come to the fullness of the matured sons and daughters of God. You come into that status. When you come into that status, you know, the whole of creation will obey you. Not when we say whole of creation, let me shock you, okay? Are you ready? Yes. When we speak of creation, we always think only the thing on this world. But I tell you, creation does not include only the things on this earth, but also things in the universe. I'll give you a clue. Okay, I'm just going to throw you an appetizer in closing. We'll continue this next year. <laughs> <laughs> Judges chapter 5 verse 20. The stars fought against Sisera from their courses. Now for, for, for many, many years, I have preached that the stars are the angels who fought with the army of Israel against Sisera and the Canaanite army. Until just a few weeks ago in Nigeria, I had a lively discussion with one of our associates. I had just quoted this scripture in my session. So during the lunch break, he respectfully asked me a question. He said, Father, you quoted this scripture. Who are the stars? I said, how is it that you do not know this answer? The angels. And then he respectfully told me, but look at the scripture. It says, stars in their causes. So I pondered for a moment. And I meditated it deeply and deeply. Stars in their causes mean the stars that orbit around in their orbits. So the stars in their causes fought against Sisera. And then the subsequent scripture says, as a result of the stars fighting, the river overflowed and rose up like a huge tsunami and flooded the whole region that caused the chariots of Sisera to be grounded and caught in the soaky mud. And Sisera then got, or Sisera is the war general of the Canaanite army. He got down from the chariot and he walked on the soggy soil to the slaughterhouse where he was slaughtered. Then, as I pondered deeply over and over, I began to understand, you know, this is common science knowledge, that the movement of the moon can raise the water levels, right? The high tide of the sea and the low tide of the sea is by the movement of the moon. So the, move, the moon can raise the water levels and lower down the water levels. And you also read where Joshua commanded the sun to stand and the moon to stand still until the war ended. So that tells us, I then realized or understood that the stars from their causes means you can command the stars in the heavenlies. 
to join forces with you to fight a war. I mean, so when you attain the full matured status of the sonship, then the creation is waiting to join hands with you and you can command the stars like how they did sporadically in the Bible. It's just one incident here and one incident there. But this will become a common occurrence in your everyday life in the last days. <laughs> finally! Oh, sorry, not finally. <laughs> I was just trying to follow the Apostle Paul, no? He says, finally, and then he wrote one entire book. And then when he reached, he said, finally, my brethren. And he ended. So sorry, not finally. Two more points to go. Are you getting tired? No. Shall I continue? Yes. Okay. The next thing that they did in the journey, Exodus chapter 18 tells us there was team ministry. Till then, the prophet Moses was the only hero or the administrator who was doing all the works. Then his father-in-law come, comes along and gives him a counsel. He said, if you do this, you will break down and die quickly. Now raise up leaders. Delegate your authority to them. And use them to work together as a team. So Moses felt he had an inner witness in his spirit that this is a counsel from God. And he set up a system that today is called the cell church system. The cell church that we have today in the church is all borrowed from Exodus chapter 18. Raising up ministry, raising up leaders. Now what does this tell us? The last day's army must work in unison. There's not going to be any big leader, small leader. Everybody will be equal. Joel chapter 2, verses 4 to 11 says, The last day's army has no leader. Everyone works in unison. No one backsteps anybody. Nobody has insecurity feeling. Everybody is a superhero. And verse 11 says, The Lord God is their commander. And the Lord will roar before his army. Okay, let me give you a very simple down-to-earth example how things are changing and if we don't change we'll be left far behind I was once traveling on a long journey on a plane and uh, so I just flipped the movies and I found a movie called the Justice League have you seen the movie yes. after this you better watch so I was looking at this movie. So the hero is Batman. You know Batman? Yeah. Okay, you know Superman? Yeah. You know Aquaman? Yeah. You know Aquaman? Yeah. Wow, you must be very old then. <laughs> I first watched Aquaman when, when I was a small boy. So if you know Aquaman, then you are very, very old. <laughs> Don't say you are young. You are very old. So there's Batman, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, you know Wonder Woman? Yeah. Okay. And then there's Flash, and then another guy called Cyborg, or Half Man, Half Machine. So these five people, oh, by the way, Superman is dead. So Superman is dead. So he's not in the picture now. So there comes an enemy, and these five people, superheroes, they'll fight this common enemy, and they found that they could not overcome him at all. They were losing the war. So when they were in a state of desperado, when they came to a zero stage, they, they, fit, they sat down, they all thought about what can they do. Then suddenly, Batman came up with this idea. We must resurrect Superman. We need him. Without his partnership, we cannot defeat the enemy. So they resurrected Superman. 
So Superman joined the team and eventually they destroyed the enemy. Now when I watch this movie, suddenly a spiritual principle dawned on me. That is, in the last days, there's not going to be one single superhero. No more. It's going to be a teamwork. All join forces together. When these six superheroes joined hands together, it was not one superhero or another superhero. It's all, it's a teamwork now. It's a teamwork. So together, they defeated the last day's enemy. This is the pattern that's going to happen in the last days. Like how it was in the early church. They were all together one. And if you look at this um, Marvel comics and DC comics movies, there is a change in the trend, you know. In the past, they produced movies of one superhero. But in the last few years, they called the movie Avengers, where a multiple of superheroes join hands together to fight one common enemy. So who is our common enemy? Yes. Satan. We have one common enemy. And we must all join hands together to fight. It's no more I great or you lesser. Or you great or me lesser. No. We, everybody is equal. We may have our ranks. But no one is going to put another one down. No one is going to backstep. No one is going to push another down and climb on top of you. Rather, we are all going to be like the ants. Help each other up. Have you seen the ants? When one ant finds a sugar, it will immediately go and tell others and bring them all and share that one sugar with everybody. So we should all become the ant man. <laughs> Don't laugh. There's great wisdom to learn from the ants, right? Even King Solomon said, go to the ends, you silly people. You lazy, go to the ends and learn. So remember people, teamwork. So there's no going to be, though there'll be a pastor, he's not going to be threatened by the church members. Even because, even the little children, they are going to do great exploits never before any incident in history. There's no precedent in history. A baby that is still drinking milk from the mother is going to do signs and wonders like never before in history. So we should not be threatened by all that, be jealous over that, but we encourage babies. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on. Amen. I have seen this, you know. Four years ago, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and he read a scroll. The time has now come for Psalms 8 to be fulfilled. Therefore, God wants you to raise up the babies and the thoughtless to do this ministry. And the scripture says, God will perfect a praise. He'll put a praise in the mouth of the babies and the thoughtless. And that will become a strength and anointing will be released through the babies and the thoughtless, and they will cast out demons. And soon after that, I received a testimony how a 12-month-old baby boy casted out one demon from a 13-year-old girl. He did not do all the mumbo jumbos like you see today. You know, today if, you, if any pastor prays for a uh, a demon possessed, they'll go through the charismatic Pentecostal mumbo jumbo jumping the whole world like cranking up an old car. <laughs> That's what they do, you know. Have you seen all these old cars that need to be cranked up? They'll go through a, all this formula and the antics of doing all that and then they'll have an, a long conversation with the demon. How are you? <laughs> Why are you here? Tell me, come on, sit down, let's talk. <laughs> All these acts of clowning. 
You see, you know, that baby, all he did, the mother came to our meeting and testified. He stretched out his right hand and just smiled. Because 12-month-old baby, you know, they don't know all the mumbo-jumbos, praise God. <laughs> he just stretched out his hand and he just smiled. And the mother's spiritual eyes were open. She literally saw an evil, dark demon come out of this 13-year-old girl and depart from their house. So this was done by a baby. And there is a three-year-old girl in a church nearby to where I live in Chennai. And she is a ghostbuster in her church. <laughs> three-year-old girl, you know, just this short. And I, I actually saw this video clipping. The, after the service is over, when the pastor calls for people to be delivered, a lot of demon-possessed people come to the front of the church, and the pastor invites this little girl. She just walks up to him. She holds the little mic in her hand. She, in Jesus' name! Jesus' name! That's all she knows how to say. And every demon-possessed people are delivered. <laughs> delivered! Thank God for a pastor like him who never felt threatened. And he encouraged the little child's giftings to be used. So we need pastors like that. We need leaders like that. Who will not feel threatened when you see the youth being used powerfully than the pastor? Because that's going to happen. The youth will rise up and do great exploits like no other miracle working man or woman of God have ever done before. Yes. Even the women will rise up in a great, as a great army to do great exploits for God. Yes. The babies, the toddlers, the children, the youths and the women. Yes. And the old men. Yes. That army is going to rise up. The nobodies, the nameless, faceless, selfless. That is the last day's army. The nameless, they don't care about their name. The faceless, they don't want any recognition. And they are selfless. They serve and they lead at the same time. No one is a leader, no one is a servant. They all are equal. That is the last day's Joel's army. All working together for a common good. Walking and working together in love. That is the key for the last days. Finally. Real finally. We come to the end of the journey now. So what is the end of the journey? Where did they end it? Now, this end of the journey is just the first part. Exodus chapter 19 verse 2 says, They camped before Mount Sinai. They camped. When they camped, two things happened. Number one, what does that camping before Mount Sinai signifies? Waiting on God. Waiting for God. Waiting together with God. Those three are three different definitions. They are not the same. Waiting for God. Waiting with God. Waiting on God. So they were waiting. And in the wait, Exodus chapter 19 verse 3 says, Moses went up to the mount. Why did he went up to the mount? To seek directions from God. So, this tells us, in the journey, you need to learn the art of waiting on God. So that you can seek directions from God. Every step of your way, you now need directions from God. For you to survive the last day's journey, 
for you to survive in the end times, for you to be successful, you must learn how to wait on God and seek directions from Him, hear from Him. So that means your spiritual ears must be open. And to see Him, your spiritual eyes must be open. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. When that happens, the Bible says, God talked with Moses. Psalms 32 verse 8 says, He will teach you, He will guide you. So when you seek God with all your heart, He will teach you, He will guide you, and bring you to the next part. So whatever we have learned today, is the first part of our journey. You need this, you need to do this preparation. The journey is going to begin. It's going to begin. And you need to prepare for the journey now. And you, you come camping before the mount. You learn the art of waiting on God. Amen? Yeah. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Holy Father, I have communicated to your children all things that you have shown me and all the words you put in my mouth. Now I pray, Lord, as your children will meditate on this, I see the blessed Lord Jesus Christ standing in our midst right now. When you spend time with the Lord, He will come to teach you and guide you. He will open to you further truths concerning what you have just read. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. My dear daughter Josephine, the Lord Jesus is standing right there beside you. And he says to you, I will command a new future for you, a new beginning in your life. Thank you. Before new wine can be poured, the old wine skin must be discarded, and a new wine skin must be brought. So do not be disheartened. I'm going to do a new thing in your life. A new thing. All your tears, the Lord Jesus shows, my dear daughter, are collected in his bottle. And they are precious before my eyes. I'm going to reward you openly. Lift you up openly. Where you were shamed, I will crown you with honor and lift you up like a princess. And I see right now, my dear daughter, a beautiful white horse standing behind you. And the Lord Jesus signifying, this is a being appointed for you to guide you to be with you do not fear any terrors that will come by night or anything that will come in the daytime the sun will not smite you in the day nor the moon in the night for I, the Lord, will be a shade all around you. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Let's lift up our holy hands. The Lord Jesus shows me now that when you spend this afternoon to meditate and to wait on Him, 
he will open your understanding and cause his light to come out of the scroll that he has for you. I see a small scroll about the size of the palm before each and every one of you. And the saints of God, members of the cloud of witnesses, spirits of just men made perfect, will even come to teach you, to counsel you, to guide you. For I am building a people of praise.